fact number two. Sure is good to be in church today, man. And uh, honored to have the privilege to be here and uh, appreciate you showing up. You know, a lot of times there are people here that the preacher's gone, you know, and they go running somewhere else. But uh, sure is good to have you this morning. We appreciate the uh, change offering. Somebody says, what in the world do you do with that? Well, uh, next month, hopefully this fall, we'll be uh, headed to Gillette, Wyoming with a load of 20,000 John and Romans and uh, taking those out to Gillette, Wyoming, and then we'll be in Montana and also in Canada coming up in, uh, in next month. And so you pray for us as we head that direction. We've also got a trip to Australia that's coming up. It's paid for. God's people paid for that. And then we've also got a trip to South America that's coming up. And so you pray for these different places as we travel and preach around the world that God would help us and give us safety on our journeys and also as we travel around here as well and just pray for us on the road. All right, Mark chapter number 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13 and uh, try to be a blessing to you this morning. I won't, I won't keep you too long, so uh, just listen real close for the next few minutes. Mark chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. I pray that you'd help us and give us a, a good time this morning. Bless the message. Do with it what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. It's got a very simple subject this morning. That's the subject of willingness. Willingness. And that is something that I think is a, a key factor in whether or not we have the ability to do what God wants us to do or not. I'm in all kind of different places, all kind of different churches, all kind of different environments. We're in some places where at the end of the service, I feel like everybody just loves us and they want to take us home for dinner and, and, and it's just a wonderful feeling, you know. And then we go into some places where I feel like I need to wear a helmet the whole time I'm there. Uh, I was talking to some, I'm teaching at a Bible college this year and it's an online Bible college and so I'll be doing the teaching on a camera and then posting that online. And I was talking to some of the other preachers that are teaching in that college. And, uh, the, you know, they were being real mean to one another. You know, they were just playing around. They were being real ugly, saying some ugly things to one another. And I said, I didn't know that teaching at this Bible college was going to mean that I was going to have to wear a helmet. And they all started laughing and, you know, they continued their picking. Well, that's the way really it is um, in, the, in the Christian world we live in today. Uh, we do enjoy one another to a certain extent. But then there are times where you feel like around the people of God, you've got to wear a helmet. Because, you know, people start backbiting and then they start complaining at one another and they start talking about one another and they start fussing at one another. And, uh, you know, that really, really bothers God. A lot of times we don't, we don't understand that there are things that bothers God. You know, that's one of them. So in discord, 
Uh, there's other things in the Bible that bothers God. You, know, you think about uh, unfaithfulness. If you're not faithful uh, to the house of God and faithful to what God wants you to do, that bothers God. If you don't have faith, if you don't trust God, that bothers God. Uh, if you have sin in your life, obviously, that bothers God. So it's easy to make a list of things that we know God doesn't like. And we lay that list down and we compare that to our lives and we say, okay, I'm not going to do this list. Okay, I know that God doesn't want me to do this and God doesn't want me to do this. And typically we have an entire life that's built on don'ts. Things that we know that God doesn't want us to do. Well, then on the other hand, we have very few things that we know God does want us to do. And here's the dangerous part. The dangerous part is that we get into our mind that the things of the church and the house of God is really all that God wants us to do. Okay, so let me explain what I'm saying by that. Okay, you think, well, I'm a Christian, therefore I need to go to church, and I need to sit on the pew, and I need to put some money in the offering plate, and I need to sing when they stand and sing, and I need to shake hands when everybody shakes hands, and I need to sit when everybody else is sitting. Listen, I've been in church for 31 years, and all kind of different churches, and there are some similarities with all churches. It's funny, you know, you go into some churches, and you sit there, and you wonder, okay, I wonder when they're going to take up the offering. You know they're going to do that. And you sit there, and you think, okay, I wonder when they're going to shake hands, because you know, a lot of churches do that. You go, some churches uh, wonder when they're going to sing a congregational. Some churches don't do congregational. Some churches just have the choir, and nobody else has to sing. And, and you know, depending on who you're sitting next to, you're kind of thankful for that, right? You know, and, and some churches, they smile at one another and have a time of, of fellowship. Some churches, you know, they don't want to do that. All kind of different things. But we become accustomed, and I'll use that word custom, we become accustomed to what our church does. And as long as we're doing those things, uh, you've got homecoming coming up, right? And so at homecoming, you have things you're going to discuss about that Wednesday night. You're going to have those things that everybody does at homecoming. When I was a kid at Swannanoa Heights Baptist Church in Swannanoa, we knew that at homecoming, uh, Jean Whittemore, the wife of Delane Whittemore, Jean Whittemore, was going to bring banana pudding. And if Gene Whittemore didn't bring banana pudding, it was the end of the earth as we knew it. So Gene Whittemore was going to bring banana pudding. That's all there is to it. And uh, I didn't know it had banana pudding. I didn't know it had bananas in it when I was a kid. I just thought it was cookie pudding. I used to always call it cookie pudding because it had those cookies in it, you know, those vanilla wafers. And so we have our preconceived notions about how things ought to be, you know, which side of the church we sit on. Uh, overseas, it's a lot different. Overseas, you have two rows. And the, the men sit on this side and the women sit on this side. All across Asia and Africa, the, the, the men sit on this side and the women and children sit on this side. That's how it works. But here it's, you know, it's a lot different than that. We have ideas about how things work. And we become willing to serve God to a certain extent. But then if it has to go beyond that, we get nervous about it. I'm the same way. Yeah, I have these, I have these uh, limitations. I have, what's the word I'm looking for? I have these borders in my life, and I don't feel comfortable when I have to cross that line and step into something that doesn't make me comfortable. I'm typically uh, shunning that. You know, wait a minute. The preacher said we're going to do what? Oh, wait just a minute. We, have, we don't do that here. Wait just a minute, you mean i got to do this? i got to do that? And we become, our willingness level comes down when things step out of the realm of what would be normal to us. Does that make sense? Okay, I, I hope it does. In my mind, I think, okay, I, I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't because I'm a Christian. I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't do this. And I'm willing to because I've always done it this way and because our church has always done it this way. I'm willing to go this far but I don't know that I'd be willing to go further than that. I think that according to the Bible, and I could prove it from the Bible, and I'll prove it to you in this story, God is looking for some people that by faith will go outside of that border. Okay, my comfort zone is a big circle here. I've got this big circle, and it's my comfort zone, and, and we do everything the same way right here in this comfort zone. But what's going to happen if I step outside of this comfort zone because God wants me to do this? I feel like there's some people that would literally, they would disintegrate if they stepped outside of their circle. 
They step out and they would just literally fall apart. You know people like that. You may be somebody like that today, that you've always had a circle and everything inside of that circle is okay, but if I step outside, oh no, it's terrible. It's funny how some of the things that we do around the world, uh, you know, make a lot of people uncomfortable, okay? There's certain situations that would make somebody uncomfortable. I don't know that I want to do this because it's not what I've always done. Okay, well, let's look at what these guys did, okay? This is a, a, the, the, the concept of willingness. How far are we willing to go to get God, to get to God, to get God's satisfaction with us, to get God to do something big? Okay, we've talked about, there's several, been several prayer requests about people that have physical problems. Well, this guy here had a physical problem, and uh, literally, he was completely paralyzed, okay? He couldn't move. Now... When Jesus was physically walking on the, on the earth, he would be like considered, for three years, he would have been considered the best doctor anybody could have ever gotten to. That if you could get to Jesus, whatever your problem was would vanish and go away, just like that. If somehow you could find him and get to him, he can fix it. Now, obviously, a lot of the healing that he did personally by touching people that, we don't see that like they did back then. But I wonder on a spiritual level, since we talk about things in the Bible from a spiritual perspective, I wonder spiritually what God could do for us if we would do everything we could to get to Him. Now there are several different types of people here in this story. Let's look at it. Remember where we, we had a crowd, a house that may have been a, a room maybe half the size of this building or maybe a, a third of the size of this building? And it was packed full of people. The house was so full that you couldn't even get in the door. There's no way. And what they were doing is they were just in there with Jesus. They were in that place with Jesus. I wonder what would happen if we actually had a church or a place that, that just like they did years ago from the stories that I've been told, where God did so great things, that did so wonderful things, that you couldn't even get in the door. There were so many people packed in there to hear something from God and to see God do something that it was so full that you couldn't even come in the door. It's been such a long time since I've heard anything like that. Because we have, what we're willing to do is to go this far, but stepping out of our circle is unheard of. Because doing that would create, oh no, oh no, what do I do? I'm outside of, of what's normal for me. I'm the same way. We're, we're creatures of habit, right? I mean, I do the same thing every morning. The past couple of mornings have been a little different for me. I've been on, uh, I've been on, on a voice rest since Tuesday because I was in the middle of a 24-night a uh, revival meeting. My throat was completely wiped out. And uh, so for a couple of days, I have tried to not be so involved with my throat so that I can do some repair work on it been drinking a lot of ginger and honey and, and lemon and that kind of thing. I had gotten out of what was the norm for me, and therefore I had to adjust myself to that. I wonder what would happen if things got out of the norm for us. I wonder what, what we would be willing to do if God asked us to do something that wasn't on our list of do's and don'ts. We know that we're not going to go down here to the, uh, the ABC store and buy whatever and go home and get drunk. Oh, we're Christians, we don't do that. We know that we're not going to go out here and, and gamble because Christians don't do that. We have a good list of don'ts outside of church. But typically, as most Christians do, our things that we do for God are limited to the four walls of the church. We step out and we let our light shine the best we can. We live as a Christian the best we can. But what about if we had a hands-on opportunity to do something for God out of the norm? Let's look at what these guys did. The first thing I want you to see is in verse number 1. This is what I call the truth of a living sovereign. Look at verse number 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that what? Read it out loud. Say it again. He was in the house. Everybody found out that, that, that this is where Jesus was at. I wonder what would happen, literally, if word got out 
that Jesus was in your house. Word got out that God Almighty was doing something big at Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church and, and at other uh, houses outside of this church where you live that God was manifesting himself and doing something big in your home. I wonder what would happen. I, I can't remember the last time that somebody walked up to me and said, you know, I just, I just kind of feel God on you. I, just, I see God in your life. Tell me how I can be like that. Tell me how I can, I can, somebody can just experience God by being with us. It's easy to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't drink. Or wait a minute, wait a minute I'm not going to gamble. Or wait a minute, I'm not going to shoot anybody today unless they make me really mad, right? I'm not going to get into a fight. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, because we're Christians and we learn how to lock arms with one another, right? We learn how to be strong with our numbers. We say, okay, well, I, he's not going to, and I'm not going to, and he's not going to, and we're going to come together. We're going to have this togetherness that will allow us to be strong and willing to not do the things that we know that we're not supposed to do. But what about stepping out of that and saying, hey, I'm willing to go one step further. I'm willing to listen to God and say, whatever you say for me, God, is what I'll do. Whatever you have in my life, God, that's exactly what I'll do. These people found out that Jesus was there. Now, I'm interested in the word Capernaum. The word Capernaum, the town where this was taking place, that word Capernaum means a village of comfort. This was a location where people knew that Jesus was present. Okay? I wonder how the world would communicate with one another when it comes to your family and your name. When the name is brought up, I wonder what people would say. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we don't even need to talk to him about this because we know that he's a child of God. We don't even want to... How big is your effectiveness in the world where we're living in today? Do you have a Capernaum? Or is your life a place where people can see Jesus? Now look at verse number 2. Not only the truth of a living sovereign, but, excuse me, verse number three, the trial of a lost soul. Look at what it says here. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, let's break this down. This is a guy that had absolutely no hope because he was, a, he was paralyzed from head to toe. He didn't have the ability to move it all on his own. Okay. Now let's look at this spiritually. All of us, before we became God's children, before we got saved, all of us had no hope outside of Jesus Christ. Outside of being saved, there was no hope for your soul outside of Jesus Christ. You remember that day? Yeah, I remember the day that I was lost. Anybody in here remember the day uh, that you, there was a time in your life where you met God and, 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 and that was a great experience for you and you, got, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you stepped out of what had been normal for you and into a spiritual realm between you and God, and you're saved, and God owns you. God is your Heavenly Father. Well, it's the same thing here. This man had never been able to get to God. Nope. He wasn't able. But there were some people that were willing to get him to God. You see the four guys? He was born of four. He was carried by four people. The word born mean, meaning to be carried... Literally, they put him on some kind of a stretcher or some kind of a net or some kind of a, a bed, and they carried him. These men carried this man all the way to Jesus. Now, from a spiritual perspective, we all know somebody that's lost. You may have a lost neighbor. You may have a lost son or daughter. You may have a lost mom or dad. You may have a lost brother or sister, aunt or uncle, cousin. You, have, you know somebody that you work with that's lost. You know somebody that uh, you're affiliated with that's lost. We have the ability not only to be the Jesus that they need to see by living the life of Jesus out in our life, but we also have the ability to carry that person to Jesus. You say, well, I've invited them to church and they won't come. I understand that you've done all you can do, but there's a way to have a fellowship with you and God, a, a prayer life, a relationship, a, a connection with God 
that allows you to say, Lord, this is my friend, this is my family member, this is my relative, and they have this need. And we don't stop at just the circle that we're in. We step out of that comfort zone and say, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes to be the person that's willing to carry this person to Jesus. Let's see what they did. Okay, the first thing was the, tr the truth of a living sovereign. Then the trial of a lost soul. But number three, the test of laboring saints. Here's the guys that actually did it. Look at verse four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Okay, so they had this bed. Brother Frank, this would have been a, an interesting thing to try. Okay, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know how interested I am in trying that. I'm afraid of heights. Okay, now I'll say that with this stipulation. I'll ride any roller coaster that you put in front of me. I'll ride it in the front with my eyes open. Yes, I will. Anything. But I know I'm buckled in. And that thing has passed all the government standards. I don't know that I would do that in, oh, well, let's say here, India or even Mexico. I don't know that I'd be riding their roller coasters. But I know that we have a high standard of tests and inspections here in this country. And I don't know, it may be getting worse. But uh, up until this point, I'll ride anything. Okay? But I know I'm harnessed in and I'm okay. But if you want me to climb up here on this roof and uh, patch something up, I'd rather pay somebody else 20 bucks to do it. I don't want to do it. I'm not interested in it. I can't go above maybe the third step on a ladder. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Okay, some of y'all going to have to be honest with me. Anybody else in here afraid of heights? Please help me. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, I'm, I'm okay. We're going to lock arms and do this thing together, right? Now, some of you literally could crawl up a coconut tree and get a coconut out of it. Or you could crawl up on top of this church and work and do whatever, and it doesn't bother you. But I get up there and my knees start shaking and my throat swells and I just know that I'm going to die. I mean, that's how I feel like when I'm up on top of something. Well, I don't know if all four of these guys were comfortable with what they wanted to do, but they knew that that person would never have a chance to know Jesus and to be touched by Jesus if they didn't step out of their comfort zone. What happened here? The test of a laboring saint. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Oh, wow. They were willing to do whatever it took to get that person to Jesus. Let's keep going here. We see number four, the talent. The talent of a loving Savior. What I mean by talent is the ability. We know that if we can get somebody to Jesus, that he can do anything. That doesn't mean he always will. But at least we know that we've done everything we can to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and do what God wants us to do. Okay, let's look at what happened. Verse 5. When Jesus saw what? Say it, say it again. Their faith. Oh, that's interesting to me. Uh, the sick of the palsy, he was unable to do it himself, but because some other people were willing to step out of their little circle long enough to let God use them, Jesus said, wow, these four guys are willing enough to go beyond the norm. I'm going to reward their faith. Now remember, he doesn't always reward your faith with what you want. In this particular case, he did. He gave them the healing of the paralyzed man. But he doesn't always do that. He will reward your faith but it may be in a way that he considers to be best. Let's keep going here. The talent of a loving Savior. Verse number... Now, now let's bring the spiritual implication here. Back to verse number 5. When Jesus saw their faith, okay, he's looking at these people that did something outside of their realm, and as a, as a reward for their going beyond their circle, he did something for this guy over here. Because that's what they were asking for. Now, he can do whatever he wants to. In this case, he rewarded their faith with what they were asking for. Now, look here. He said, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, what? Say it out loud. 
thy sins be forgiven thee. So now we have taken something that's physical and now we're bringing it into the realm of the spiritual. Okay, so let's do all that today. Forget this man's physical problem. He has a problem and he can't get to Jesus. But now let's make it all spiritual. Listen, we all have problems. But a lost person, a lost person that has never heard the gospel cannot get to God unless we take God to them or unless we bring them to God, okay? Now, I don't understand why it works this way, but listen very closely, and I'll close in just a minute. There's the way that God designed it. I don't understand why he designed it this way. But the way God designed it is that he depends on us to do the work for him. I don't understand that. Now, Jesus in his omnipresence and Jesus in his omniscience, knowing everything and being everywhere, he could have very easily went to that paralyzed man's house and done his thing. He could have very easily done that. But he didn't. He was in a place, everybody knew he was there, and therefore they did everything they could to bring that person who had a spiritual need and Jesus solved the problem. Okay, here's what I'm getting to. What if Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church was such an explosive place with the power of God. Now listen, I can't, I can't name you five places right now. I can't anywhere in the world. Five that are so explosive with the power of God that people are coming just to see what God's up to. I don't know five. My home church. My own home church. Sometimes we wonder, and these other churches that, that we go to around the country, we're so satisfied, we're so satisfied with just doing everything that's in the circle. Everything's in the circle. Everything's in the circle. But we're in the circle, everything's okay. But what if? What if it made the newspaper? Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church, God is doing something big. Come see what God's doing. What if it made the radio station? God's doing something big. At Gabriel's Creek Baptist Church. It, it could very well happen. It could happen. When people found out that this is a Capernaum, this is a place of comfort, this is a place where God's at, this, and we know that. We know that. But what if everybody out there knew it? What if we were willing to say, okay, God, whatever it takes for the world to see Jesus through me, I'm willing to do it. That's what these guys said. Whatever it takes. And they had to do something hard. It was difficult. But they made a way for their friend to come to know Jesus. Now, the talking of the liberal spectators. Look here in verse number 6. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? That's what happens, see. When, that's why we limit ourselves. We say, well, I'll go this far because that's what I'm comfortable with. But when we step out of the comfort zone, people around us start talking. Oh, can you believe it? Blah, 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 blah. There's liberal spectators on the sidelines, and they're viewing what's going on, and they're saying, wait a minute. That's not supposed to be like that. Wait a minute. That's not right. Wait a minute. And they start jibber-jabber. You know anybody like that? Oh, yeah. I know some people like that. They find out what's going on and they start speculating about it. That doesn't matter. Did that stop Jesus? Did it stop Jesus? No, it didn't stop Jesus. He went ahead and did the job, got the job done. Now, let's keep going here. Then what I see, the triumph, the triumph, the victory of a loving Savior. Verse number 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he saith unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? Now look at verse number 11. I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. All of a sudden, Jesus solved the problem. All of their hard work paid off. Isn't it good when y'all have the, the uh, Christmas drive through or when you have a special event here and everybody's working, uh, going outside of the norm? outside of the, and you do something around the house of God to try to make sure that you're touching the community and you're reaching the community, and you sit back and you take a deep breath and say, wow, oh, I felt pretty good. Don't it feel good? Well, we've done something out of the norm. We've stepped outside of the comfort zone long enough to touch somebody. 
long enough to reach somebody, long enough to be a blessing to somebody. Y'all have a hospice ministry here, right? Hey, there's not many people that do that. It's great when you have something that, that you say, Lord, I'm looking for an avenue, a way to reach people that need you. But I don't want to get out of my circle. I don't want to step out of my comfort zone because that makes me nervous. And then God says, okay, there's not a whole lot I can do. But when you say, Lord, whatever it takes, that's what I'll do. Lord, here's a blank check in my life. Here's a blank contract. I'll sign the bottom of it. You just fill in blank, I'll do it. Oh, there's no telling what God would not only tell us to do, but that he would empower us to do. Then there's lastly the teamwork of the laboring saints. This was an amazing thing that took place. Can you imagine? Let's back up in the story a little bit. Here are these four guys, and they decided they were going to do whatever it took to get that person that was sick of the palsy to Jesus. And they come to the door. They can't even get to the door. There's hundreds and hundreds of people packed in there like sardines and all around the building. There's people everywhere. By the way, that happened to Jesus every day. I mean, he was just always bombarded with crowds and crowds of people. So let's just say, let's just, let's just have the conversation here. You want to do that? Let's have the conversation. You got these four guys. Uh, let's pull out four names. My, my first two names would be Brian Timothy. So let's say there's a Brian and a Timothy. And we'll say Gary Dean. That's my dad's two names, if y'all didn't know that. Gary Dean. Brian Timothy, Gary Dean. By the way, anybody that wants to jest with him, they call him Gary Dean. Okay, let's just. Brian, Timothy, Gary, and Dean. Okay, there's four guys. Brian, Timothy, Gary, and Dean. And they're all standing around talking. I said, well, we got them this far. What do we do now? I mean, they had already stepped out of their comfort zone, right? Because they, they were at home. They were trying to help their friend. And now they've got him on this, this stretcher, on this bed. And they're trying to get this person to Jesus. Now, forget his physical problem. We're speaking on a spiritual realm right now. They've done whatever they could to rescue the soul of this person. It got him this far. That's what we do. We go so far until we hit a wall. Oh, wait a minute. I've come too far. I can't go any further than this. This is, this is the best I can do. I'm done. We drop the bed and we go back home. So Brian and Timothy and Gary and Dean are standing there talking about what we do now. And maybe Dean says, Dean says, I know what we can do. I'm a carpenter. I put on roofs just like this one. I think I put this roof on. We go right up there in the middle of that roof and tear it apart. Oh, man, I don't know if anybody in this whole room would be willing to go to their neighbor's house, climb up on top with an axe and go, whack, whack. Anybody in here willing to do that? No, we're in a county that has lots of people bearing arms. Amen, right there? I don't know how willing we'd be to do that. I mean, a few noises like that in my house, and I'm going to be right there underneath it with something cocked and ready to go. Come on now. You're not so spiritual that you wouldn't do that. Come on now. So they're standing there, yeah, I think we could probably do that. Take a look at, uh, and this is Timothy. He's talking. Yeah, I think we could probably get up there. And so Brian over here, Brian, God love him, he's like me. I ain't getting up there. I'll fall and die. No, I'm not. By the way, you know how much irony is within this? Because literally they, they had nothing to lose because Jesus was right in there and he could, you know, bring him back to life anyway. But oh no, 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 no. I'm not getting on that plane. That thing will crash. I'm not going on that boat. That thing will sink. I'm not climbing on that ladder. We'll all die. That's how we are, right? We'll go so far and then say, Lord, I'm not willing to go past that. I've come to a wall. I know we've got to get him in there, but I'm not going up there. I don't know. That's all speculation. Somehow, it had been fun to figure it out. Somehow, they got that man on the roof took those clay shingles, take big chunks of clay, ripped those apart, probably sawed through whatever little bit of roof system that they had and made a hole big enough, a hole as big as a church pew, had to. 
You got a man laying down, probably five feet at least long, and probably two feet or three feet at least wide. Can you imagine everybody in that house? You know, they're feeling sawdust on their head. And they look up, and, it's, and there's somebody cutting a hole in the roof. How many times have you seen that happen? Anybody? Any takers? I mean, we're in her church, and, and somebody cutting a hole in the roof. I mean, there'd be somebody mad about it. And undoubtedly, somebody did get mad, but they had enough faith to tie ropes to the corner of that stretcher or that bed or whatever it is, and they lowered him down in there. You don't see anywhere in the story where, you know, Gary or Dean or Timothy or Brian climbed down the hole and stepped up and touched Jesus and said, wait a minute, we're fixing to let somebody down. You need to get everything ready. That's how we do, right? We, we, we want to make sure everything's just exactly right so that we'll be, what's that word again? Comfortable? Is that what it is? We don't want to step out of our, hey, these guys, according to this story, they didn't seem to really care about anything but getting that person that had a need to the only one that could fix it. And they did everything they could to get there. They were willing. They got to the wall, the wall of the house. There's no way to get in except by stepping out of what would be considered normal. So my question to you is, how far are you willing to go to bring the world to Jesus? Number one, are you willing to work together? I think we are, right? Willing to work together? You just took on the Sam Gossett family. He just flew back to the Philippines over the weekend. He's back over there with the Victory Baptist Church doing a great job. His wife is still here. They're having to get shots for the kids and some other do doctor. Because his son, was um, Noah here or was Sam by himself? He's by himself. He has a, how old is Noah? Seven? Six? Seven? Six or seven year old son that's very autistic and uh, they have to have specialized doctors for him and so she's here taking care of business with them and she'll go back later on this year. But uh, what you have done, you're working together by bringing your money together and saying we're going to help that man live over there in the Philippines doing great things. See, that's working together. But are you willing to work together to step outside of your comfort zone and say, Lord, whatever it takes or whatever you want for me to do, that's what I'm willing to do. Are you willing to cancel personal plans? So we have this disease, and the, disease, the spiritual disease that we have is that I'll do anything God says as long as it doesn't interfere with what I'm doing already. Uh-oh. Number three, willing to make an effort. I'm willing to do whatever God says to do as long as I don't have to get up off of my pew. I'm, the reason I'm saying all this is because I, I find so many people that are this way. I'll do whatever God says, but I ain't getting up from here. I've come to the wall, and I'm not going to climb on the roof, right? I, I'd have trouble with it. Willing to miss a meal. Willing to be embarrassed. <laughs> These guys are willing to be embarrassed, weren't they? They're willing to get their heads chopped off. Willing to not care what everybody else thinks. Isn't that a tragedy? Isn't that a tragedy? Well, I would do so and so, but I can't because what if somebody else thinks something weird about me? Willing to prioritize Jesus over doing something crazy like cutting a hole in a man's roof. Willing to face danger. Willing to put their life at risk. Willing to have 100% confidence in the ability of Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Whoever of those four guys, whoever's idea it was, who was it? Brian, Timothy, Gary, and Dean. Okay, They're all standing here. And uh, who was it that had the idea? Dean? Dean said, let's go up there. Let's climb up on the roof. And them other guys were like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. We're going to get ourselves killed. It's okay to talk about it. But if that's what God wants you to do, You'd be much safer doing whatever God said. To do. Now listen, I don't want anybody leaving here and going cutting holes in their neighbor's roofs. Please don't do that. At least not because I said to. I mean, if God tells you to do that, it's fine. And you say, Lord, whatever you say. And God says, okay, do this. And you say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's dangerous. That's scary. I don't, of course it is. 
We live in a dangerous and scary world. We live, I mean, I, I've gone into places where I second guessed what I was doing because it was so scary and dangerous. I get there and I'm, I'm in the same town staring at the, at the big high rise of El Chapo Guzman, the biggest drug lord in the world. And if they know that I'm there to preach or to try to sway the Catholics to Jesus, they'll shoot you. And I get a second guess of myself and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I got a family and I got this and I got this and I got this. Maybe I should just go back to Anchor Baptist Church and sit there and whatever the preacher says, we'll, we'll get those things done. But outside of that, I'm just going to sit there. Right? What about if God says, hey, Dean, step out of your comfort zone. Hey, Brian, step out of your comfort zone. Hey, 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 hey. And we say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm willing to go this far. But I'm not willing to climb up on here. Are you with me? Willingness. Let's close with this. Willing to have 100% confidence in the ability of Jesus. They said, Dean said, let's get up on the roof, cut a hole, let him down. He started devising a plan. He's got pulleys, he's got ropes, he's got everything that he needs. He's working it up, he's drawing it out on paper. He's putting a plan together and the other three guys are saying... But what if it don't work? Here's the important thing about that. When your priority is Jesus, the result doesn't matter. For example, it's not my responsibility to make an apple tree put out apple apples. That's not my responsibility. But if I want to have an apple tree, I'm going to plant the seed and do everything I can to make sure that that apple tree has what it needs. I'm going to sow, I'm going to water, I'm going to do everything I can. But I can't make that tree put out apples. I can put a, a corn in the ground and cover it up, but I cannot make that corn produce other corn. I can't do it. But all I can do is put it in the ground. So our, our act of willingness is not whether or not Jesus will actually do what we want him to do, but we're just willing to do whatever it takes to say yes to God. That's the bottom line. Whatever it takes, Lord, in my life, I'll do it if it'll make you happy. I'll do it to see us to, to make... And the, the Bible, by the way, says in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. These guys could have done whatever... But the only way that they could please God is to be men of faith. And say, Lord, whatever you say, if you want me to climb on the roof, cut a hole and let him down, that's what I'll do. But if you want me to just stand here and wait, that's what I'll do. Whatever he says, do it. Are you with me? Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. I pray that you'd help us to be willing people. To just say, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Lord, wherever you want me to go, that's where I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, that's what I'll say. However you want me to live, that's how I'll live. Help us to be people with willing hearts, to be willing vessels. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to, I just want to say one more thing, just as you're quietly praying. Just pray and ask God to help you to be a willing person, to be willing to do whatever God says, 100% willing. If you want to come pray in the altar, you can do that. If you want to bring your wife or bring your husband and Say, Lord, help me to be willing. Help me to be a willing person. But I want to say this. There's a major difference between a vessel and a reservoir. Usually we like being reservoirs. We just sit there and take in and take in and take in and hold it and hold it. But a vessel takes in and pours out and takes in and pours out and takes in and pours out. What are you today? Are you willing to be a reservoir and just soak it up? Or are we willing to be vessels that will take it in and then pour it out? Maybe you want to just maybe just want to pray there quietly in your, in your seat and say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it is in my life. Again, our Father, we're so thankful, so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. Help us to be willing vessels to do whatever you would have us to do in these last days. As we see the day approaching, help us to be willing. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen.